everyone. Hi, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank you all for coming here today. My name is Lena Lozier, and I'm a grade 12 student, and I am a part of the Student Council. This year, we have been lucky enough to have a partnership with the Salt Spring Forum, and that is the reason we have brought this wonderful speaker here today. I would first like to acknowledge that we are on the, on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. Now, I'm going to shortly introduce the speaker and the moderator. Today's guest speaker is Jeff Dunbicki, who is an internationally successful freelance climate journalist and author. His work appears in outlets around the world. His award-winning book, Are We Screwed? How a New Generation is Fighting Climate Change, and he is, we are lucky enough to have him here today. And he is a wonderful person, and I'm sure he'll have a lot of insightful things to say. And our moderator today is Sky Lozier, who is the current premier of British Columbia Youth Parliament, and he is a student at the University of Victoria in, and he is studying political science and human dimensions of climate change. He is also a former GISS student and a, for, and a former forum volunteer, and he is also my big brother. <laughs> so I would ask everyone to join me in welcoming both Jeff and Sky. It's good to be Hello. back at. Hello, is everything's working? All right. It's good to be back at GISS. It's been a little while since I've been here, but always nice to come back. And uh, thank you all so much for coming out, and thank you to the teachers who you know brought your kids here. Um, you know, both Jeff and I, you know, been involved with um, climate change and youth activism for quite a while, and so obviously this is a really important topic to both of us. And that's kind of a good way to get us started off. Is Jeff? Maybe if you can just tell everyone a little bit about how you got involved in this kind of this world. Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you for, for having, me, having me here, and it's my first trip to Salt Spring Island, and great so far. Um, so I, I grew up in Edmonton, and obviously that's a city run by oil and gas, and the playground that I used to go to was literally built underneath an oil refinery operated by Shell. So. Um, I've, I've been interested in environmental issues from a, a pretty young age. And when I graduated high school, I decided to go study journalism in Ottawa. And after I was done that, I moved to Vancouver and I started working at this really um, small but awesome online news magazine that probably a lot of you have heard of called The Taiyi. Um, and so with, within a few years of, of working there, I had become the lead climate change reporter at the Taiyi. And, and a couple years back, um, I, I read a, a scientific study that totally changed how I think about global warming and set me on the path that led to this book. And the study was by a climate scientist named James Hansen. And in the study, he, he predicted that if, if we continue along the current path that we're on in regards to climate change, um, it wouldn't be too long before we see a multi-meter sea level rise because of the ice caps melting. This would flood every coastal city on the planet, Vancouver, London, Mumbai, New York, you would have mass migrations of people that would make the Syrian refugee crisis look quaint in comparison. This would be happening at the same time that um, our agriculture would be collapsing. You would have glaciers melting, water drying up, um, wars over resources. And, and James Hansen said there was the potential for all of this to lead to civilization collapsing. It was, it was like reading crazy science fiction. And he said, all of this could happen by the year 2065. And, and so I, I read this study and, and I thought, well, if, if this is all possible, why are people like Donald Trump pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement? Why are 
companies like Exxon pulling more oil out of the ground instead of moving away from oil. And, and then it, it struck me, the, the leaders of, of these types of companies and, and the politicians like, like Trump, and, and he's only one example of, of many across the world, they literally won't be alive to see the consequences of their actions. And, and I, I, I kept returning to this date, 2065, because that's, that's less than 50 years away. This, this doomsday scenario that Hansen was describing could happen within my lifetime. And if you're 35 years or younger, it could happen within your lifetime too. And, and so after reading this study, that was when climate change became real to me in a way it, it hadn't before. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, so I, uh, you know, that's one side of it. Um, but then the, the other side that, you know, is important is, you know, where's the hope? And, you know, Jeff's book is, you know, and I'm not finished reading it, but midway through reading it myself and is, you know, an incredible story and sheds a lot of light on, you know, young people getting involved in this world. So, I mean, I guess I have to ask, are we screwed? <laughs> and that, so yeah, that is the title of my book. And... I guess at the time I, I read this study, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe we are. But if, if that had been my answer and if I had stuck with that, the, the story kind of would have ended there. I, I wouldn't have, have gone on this journey that resulted in a book and I wouldn't be sitting here right now. And, and so, so what happened after after I, I had started thinking about what James Hansen was saying, is that um, I realized that, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not the only one who, who cares about climate change in the world. There, there are millions and millions of other people of, of all ages who, who care passionately about making a difference on this. Um, but when it, when it comes to my, my own generation, um, you know, we, we became the, um, and I, I'm saying we um, in, in the sense of a millennials or, or anyone younger, we became the largest generation in the world over the last few years. And in, in Canada and in, and in the U.S., there are millions and millions of us. And as an age group, we, we outnumber the people in power. And so I thought, you know, there's, there's got to be really... Um, fascinating and, and powerful examples of, of people my age taking on climate change in new and interesting ways. And, and so this was kind of the beginning of, of a journey I undertook to places like San Francisco and Washington, D.C. And, and the Alberta tar sands and New York and, and the Paris climate talks. And along the way, um, I, was, I was interviewing um, people who were in my age group, and, and I was asking them, what, what are you doing to, to fight climate change? And I was, I was totally blown away by what I found. Um, I, I learned, for example, that a refusal of, of people in their 30s and their 20s to work in the oil and gas industry could potentially block $100 billion worth, worth of new projects, or that um, the fossil fuel divestment movement, which had started on college campuses and then spread around the world, had now become a, a five trillion dollar global movement, or that um, a surge of young Canadian voters in the 2015 election had played a decisive role in removing Stephen Harper from office, or that in in the U.S. during the the 2016 election. Um, people my age had turned um, a self-declared socialist named Bernie Sanders, who also happened to have the most aggressive climate change platform in history into a serious contender for U.S. president, even though we know how that election turned out. And, and so as a result of, of meeting all these people and hearing their stories and learning all of these amazing facts, I realized actually that, that we are a lot less screwed as a human species than it might appear from the headlines. OK. 
Great, good to get a little hope. So now we're gonna turn it over to the audience in the traditional Salt Spring Forum fashion. And so what that means is um, we have Fraser, who's right there in the back. Maybe if you wave Fraser. Um, he has a microphone, so if you have a question, um, you can put your hand up and Fraser's gonna try to get to you. Uh, we do have a short time, so I'm gonna ask that you try to keep your questions brief and to the point. Um, you know, you ask the question, Jeff will answer. We don't wanna have a story and then a question. Um, so if we can try to keep them brief and to the point, that would be amazing. Um, and yeah, so with that, anyone want to start us off? Yeah. How would you handle people who believe human-caused climate change is a hoax? Good um, question. <laughs> well, before um, a climate change denier became president, I would say just ignore them. They'll go away soon. But obviously that, that didn't work out very well. <laughs> but I think, I think what's happening now is that you can be in favor of action that's good for the environment without even believing in climate change. And to give you one example of that, I was recently doing a magazine story about Texas. Um, which is sort of ground zero for climate change denial. And I was interviewing people across the state because, as it turns out, um, Texas is one of the biggest producers of renewable energy in the United States. And, and the reason that it's building so many wind turbines and solar panels is because um, the cost of these technologies has come down dramatically over the last few years and people in Texas are making millions and millions of dollars by, um, by building this stuff. And then it also happens to have the happy benefit of being really good for climate change. And so I think if, if you encounter someone in a conversation who says, well, I don't believe climate change is real, then, then I would say to them, well, do you like a healthy economy? Do you like employing thousands of people in new jobs, because if you do, you should support a lot of the solutions to climate change, whether you believe in it or not. Awesome, yeah, so up here and then, perfect. How likely do you think the apocalypse that you described is? How likely? Um, the, that study that I read by James Hansen was, it was a worst case scenario. And, and a, lot of, a lot of scientists looked at it and, and made critiques and said, you know, the timing is, is probably a bit faster than, than we predict. Um, so I, I would say what I just described is, is not necessarily likely, but it's also something that we have to take seriously and the stronger the action we take now, the less likely that apocalypse will become reality. And, and if you look at, um, at, at anything like, like insurance or the military or, or people running um, a large corporation, it's, it's always a good idea to, to keep um, a really good assessment of, of what risks you face because the price tag of, of dealing with those is always much higher than um, taking the steps that you can right now to, to avoid them in the future. I believe in the next few weeks there's going to be a, a court case uh, against the US government by children. Is a is that a, 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 a process that we could do in Canada, like have Canadian children take our uh, government to court for not acting quickly enough on climate change? Like expanding Kinder Morgan, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and, and those, those types of lawsuits are really interesting. I, I don't know if, if any of you saw, but yesterday the city of New York announced that it would be suing the, the world's five biggest are five of the biggest oil companies like Shell and Exxon and whatever. Um, and for a long time, um, the oil industry and, and governments didn't really take 
these types of lawsuits very seriously. But I think that's starting to change. In November, I went down to Seattle and I interviewed a lawyer who um, became famous in the 1990s for suing the big tobacco companies. His name is Steve Berman. And at the time, um, this was in about 1995 or so, his law partners said, don't go after these big companies. It's crazy. It will, it will bankrupt your law firm. You'll be humiliated. Um, you'll just become a laughingstock. And Steve Berman said, you know, I, I, I think there's a case here. I think these tobacco companies lied to the public about the dangers of cancer. And, and sure enough, he was part of a wave of legal action that ended up costing those companies over $200 billion. And Steve Berman is now representing the city of New York in that current lawsuit, along with the cities of San Francisco and Oakland. And I think when, when you have lawsuits like that, and you have legal action like what you described, um, with, with the youth bringing a case against the US government, this is only going to build more and more. And it just takes one case to go through to create a sort of legal avalanche where you start seeing very rapid changes. Awesome, yeah, we got a couple up here and, and someone back there. What can we do as a community to help prevent climate change? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, I, through my research I learned um, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of obvious stuff like, you know, recycling more, composting more, riding your bike, changing your light bulbs, you know, the, the stuff we normally hear about. And, and that, that stuff is, is really important, but I think um, the one thing you can do that um, will create immediate and lasting change and and we'll, we'll change our system in ways that, that really fixes climate change rapidly is, is to go out and vote. And if you're not old enough um, to vote, to convince someone older than you to, to go and vote for politicians who take this problem seriously. Our individual choices do matter. They make a difference. But they're no substitute for having a leader in power who is taking really strong action on these issues. And, you know, unfortunately, we see evidence of the reverse all the time. The US was actually making pretty decent progress on climate change, and then Donald Trump came into power, and overnight, um, the US is, is suddenly at the very back of the world. So if I had to just give one suggestion of what to do. It's, it's vote, be politically engaged, and convince everyone you know to go out and support politicians who take this seriously. With the rise of the internet and social media and the subsequent flurry of facts and alternative facts, opinions, ideology, and whatever, is climate change not a question of proper education and scientific fact? Um, I, I don't think it is. I think education matters for people who are already interested in the environment and in creating a more equitable and less environmentally destructive world. Definitely, um, education is good, but it, it's been shown over and over again that the more education doesn't convince people who are already predisposed to disagree on these issues. And, and as we know now in the US, um, with the rise of sites like Infowars and Breitbart and with, with Donald Trump himself, there is a large community of people who, who are living in a universe that's, that's sort of blind to reality. As a journalist, it's very fascinating and terrifying at the same time to watch. And I would say the, the best way to, to deal with that is, is to, one, um, encourage the growth of things like renewable energy, which, which create jobs and income and avoid issues of what is causing climate change. 
And the other way to, to deal with um, the rise of, of the things you're describing is to, um, is to make our side, the side that cares about the future, about the planet, and about having a diverse and inclusive society, to make our side powerful enough to win and to, to turn that other side into a marginal force in politics. And, and I know I'm, I'm repeating myself, but the way we do that is, is to turn out in higher numbers, to vote, and to elect people who are going to, to take this seriously. And that's how we, we counter the rise of, of the alt-right and all of these other things. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to know, what is journalism's role in combating climate change, and how can we as a society support that? Um, well, journalism, unfortunately, has, has not done a great job of talking about climate change. And in the US election, for example, I think climate change was only mentioned a few times in high-profile publications, and then in a lot of the, the debates, it wasn't mentioned at all. Um, but what you're seeing is that the, the smaller, more independent outlets, like the Taiyi, for example, or um, there, are, there are lots of sites in, in the U.S. as well, Inside Climate News, Vox, and even some of the, the bigger organizations like, like The Guardian. They are all committed to, to publishing um, um, excellent, hopeful, solutions-oriented journalism on this stuff. And um, they could definitely benefit from your support. I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fundraising for my old employer right now, but the, the Taiyi does, does fundraising drives all the time, and, and that money goes towards building the type of climate coverage we need to really address this crisis seriously. I'm just gonna give everyone a heads up. We've had a lot of questions from up here, um, and so I wanna see at least one question from the back, you know, that group of students, those high school students. I wanna see some questions come from there shortly. Uh, as an educator, I'm aware that your talents in communicating the message lies in your ability to write. Mm -hmm. What other skills and abilities would you say our non-voting, non-voting age youth would be uh, beneficial to develop? What skills and abilities? Um, I think, I think on a certain level, the, the crisis of climate change comes from um, disconnection. And disconnection from our, from our surroundings, from the environment, from from each other it, it comes from this sense that you know we're all kind of existing on our own as individuals and we're competing with each other for scarce resources and and if i help you um i risk losing out in this competition and so i think you know at um at a very early age or at an old age or or at whatever age um i think as I think whatever we can do to, to encourage people to look beyond their own individual existence, to learn how to, um, to garden, to, to go out in nature, to, to work on things with other people um, in their communities, even if it's as small as just building a bike shed. All, all of these things are, are important. They come to define who we are as human beings. And then when you're in a position to do something more about climate change, or you're in a position to vote, or you're in a position to make society better in any way, you'll already have the temperament that will allow you to be successful in doing that. What would you do about the people spreading misinformation, especially those with power to youth? Wow, that's a, a tricky one. Um, 
And I guess we're, we're kind of seeing that play out right now um, with, with people like, like Donald Trump in power. But we've, we also saw it in, in Canada for a long time um, with um, Stephen Harper running the country sort of like it was an oil company and saying, you know, climate change is, is not a big deal. Um, and, and we need to just create um, jobs in, in oil and gas and, and not worry about the future. And, and so I, I guess I, I don't know exactly what, what the solution to that was, but I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that, that even during the, the worst of, of the Stephen Harper years, um, when, when he had a majority and um, there was a revolving lineup of, of oil and gas lobbyists coming through his office and he was putting out disingenuous information every day, that, that didn't seem to, to penetrate a lot of people. And, and what, what you saw was that um, these types of messages and this, um, this unwillingness to take action on the environment actually turned a lot of voters off and it, it created the backlash that we saw in 2015. And so I, I can't say exactly what, what the causes of that were, but it, it gives me hope to know that even though there's all this false information out there and even though it's being um, put out there by people in power who we should be trusting to take our future seriously, that um, millions of people across Canada and across the world know that that's false and that when we fight back, we can create really immediate change. Um, it's been said that capitalism is an inherently destructive system, uh, specifically when, when polluters aren't required to pay for their pollution. I mean, all these externalities, and you could say greenhouse gas emissions are one of the largest externalities that we don't pay for, or the polluters don't pay for, the rest of the world does. Do you think that fixing climate change is compatible with our current form of capitalism? Um, no. <laughs> but I think at, at the moment, capitalism is what we've got, and we can, we can leverage it in ways that that change capitalism and that also help us achieve the environmental goals um, that we want to achieve. One way to do that is um, to encourage the growth of companies that take climate change seriously. And, and there are a lot of them these days. Um, a few years ago, I went to a conference in New York that was being hosted by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And it's a business group that tracks the rise of um, low carbon businesses. And I, I thought this would just be a little event with, with a couple dozen leaders of small companies. And um, as it turned out, there was, there was an A-list of, of world leaders and CEOs and um, there was, there was a ton of interest from the media, and, and I saw in that room, there was, there was over a thousand people. Um, I saw that the, the business, in very real ways, um, was acknowledging that, um, that climate change is real and that a lot of money can be made off of fixing it. And, you know, this, I, I don't think this is, this is an ideal solution. Um, I, I think ideally, you know, we would be creating an economy that is, is, a lot, is a lot more local, that is a lot smaller scale, and we, we do see that happening in places like, like Salt Spring Island. Um, but I think with, with time ticking down, um, you know, it's, we can encourage the growth of, of this part of capitalism that, that is going to, to implement renewable energy and other solutions at large scale, and we can do all we can to kill off the old capitalist model, which is run by big oil companies and propped up by subsidies from federal governments, and this will have an immediate action and create openings for the types of alternatives we would like to see. Uh, we got a couple up here, Fraser, maybe in the front row. Um, 
I have so many questions. I'm going to try and pick one. Um, what, what do you think about peak oil and the the difficulty of replacing all of our uh, all of our fuel with much inferior sources that also depend upon oil in a minor way? <laughs> um, well, peak oil is actually it's really fascinating because it's it's turned. Um, into a debate about peak oil demand. And, and so ba basically this is the idea that because of solutions to climate change, because of people using less oil, and because of the rise of things like electric vehicles, um, the world's use of oil is, is going to peak sometime soon and then start declining. And, and so this might not sound like a very big deal, but to just put it into context, um, over the last couple years, oil prices crashed. Oil got, got very, very cheap. And, and this absolutely decimated the Canadian tar sands. Almost every major oil company, Shell, um, BP, Total, sold off their investments in the oil sands and said, you know, we. We don't think this industry is profitable anymore. And that was caused by a relatively small drop in oil demand. If peak oil demand were to actually happen, um, the, the oil industry would stop seeing its profits increase. You would see investors um, flee from the industry en masse. And I've spoken to people who have predicted this could cause the oil industry as we know it to collapse. And so, what happens next is is difficult to say, but um, even oil executives like the current head of um, Shell, for instance, is predicting that peak oil demand could happen within five to ten years. So I think we're we're in store for some some very rapid changes. And and as far as replacements go, um, electric vehicles are are very small right now. But it's, it's worth remembering that the iPhone has only existed for 10 years. And when you have um, a technology with as much potential to benefit and change society as an electric car, that can be adopted very, very rapidly. So assume that not too much in the future energy will be free because of solar and wind and transportation will be free because pods will pick us up and take us where we want to go and we'll have food on our roofs and there's no more climate change. What, where do you think the conversation will go about the future will go once we get there? And what should young journalists who are 22 now be looking into? And by the way, congratulations. I looked at some of your body of work on that tie the articles you've been publishing since the mid-2000s, really great stuff. Thank you. Um, well, I have, I have good news and bad news. <laughs> um, the good news is there, there is huge momentum um, towards the kind of future you're describing, where, where we're, we're using radically less oil, we're growing food more locally, um, our, our transportation is, is, is totally changed, we don't own private cars anymore, and, and our way of life is, is better. Um, and, and in that type of future, oil companies like Exxon and Shell basically can't exist in their current form. So the, there are going to be massive changes to our economy and to our society. Um, however, there is the danger that in moving towards the shift, we, we give massive amounts of power to a new set of corporate overlords. And those could be the, the Amazons and the Googles and the Teslas and whoever else. So I think we, we have to be careful as we make this shift um, that, that we are privileging regular people as much as possible, and that we aren't just blindly giving away power to, to a new set of, of corporations. And I, I don't know exactly how, how we achieve that, but this is, this is a question that I think as a society we'll be um, dealing with more and more as, as we move forward on this. Um, so we got one question up here, Fraser. Yeah, awesome. 
Yeah, I was wondering if you have an electric car. <laughs> do, do I? No, un unfortunately. Um, I, I just have a, a used um, beater Volvo from the 90s. But I, I, mostly, I mostly walk because my studio is down the road. Um, as soon as they come down in price enough to afford one, um, then I, I may get an electric car, or maybe I'll just wait um, until um, there, are, there are cars on the road being driven by robots that you hail from your, your smartphone, and then I won't need to own one. So we'll, we'll just see how it all turns out. <laughs> How long do you, do you think the human race would live under these conditions and problems we are suffering currently? <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Um, I think, I think we've, we, we face challenges now that, that we've, we've never faced before. And challenges that are, are really scary to contemplate and, and that have the potential to to radically change the world we live in for the worse. But like I said at the beginning, um, I don't think we're just going to be moving into this future without any sort of resistance. And, and I think part of, part of what we're seeing right now in, in the US with, with Donald Trump and with, with oil companies running the government and, and with all the negative things we see around the world becoming so strong and, and in our faces right now is, is kind of the, the last gasp of this, this old order that's trying to desperately defend itself against the changes that it knows is coming. And so the question now is whether that old order creates um, damage that is lasting and and that we're going to have to live with for a long time and and I'm I'm hopeful that that ultimately as a human species will move in the right direction so I I don't think that we we have to worry about not existing um, and totally destroying the planet but we also have to take the possibility of that extremely seriously and do everything we can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Hi, my name is Michael. I, um, I'm 34 years old and being in this, it's been a long time since I've spent a lot of time in this school environment and I guess being here is making me reflect on my coming of age as a politically engaged citizen. And so I guess I'm curious to hear your experience. What are some of the milestones along your path to being as committed as you are and to eventually writing the book that you wrote and being here today? And if it is in your book, I'm sorry, I haven't read your book yet. I only found out about this yesterday. <laughs> um, so what were, what were the steps for me? Um, well, I mean, I... I kind of knew I wanted to be a writer from, from a fairly young age. And, and like I said, I, I grew up in Edmonton. And I'm, I'm not lying when I say that, that my playground was literally underneath an oil refinery. Um, like you would go down the slide and look up and see the towers with, with the flames coming out of it. And, and as a child, I even knew like, hmm, this, I don't think this is what everyone um, does. Uh, <laughs> So I, I was kind of thinking a bit bigger picture from a young age and saying like, like mom and dad, like why, why is that flame like 60 feet tall? It's scaring me. <laughs> um, but I, I think in, in, in terms of politics, um, I have to say I, I didn't become super politically engaged until my, my mid-20s. And even when I first started in journalism, I, I was a bit apathetic and, and cynical. Um, I, I hate to say there, there were elections that I skipped because I just didn't think my participation would, would make a difference. Um, and, and two things really changed my mind about that. One, one was the, the Alberta election a few years ago where, where the NDP came into power. 
And, and that, that just completely blew my mind because I, I grew up in Alberta and always saw it as this extremely conservative place. And I, I thought, you, you, you will never see progressive change in Alberta. And then, then when that election happened and I, I saw this, this new government for the first time in, in decades, it, it really opened up my mind. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I was wrong to be so cynical and apathetic. And then the, the, the second thing that really happened was, was the 2015 election um, in Canada. Um, and and I, I had always thought, you know, whether, whether it's Harper or whether it's another leader, you know, they're, they're all the same. They're, they're all just interested in themselves and they don't care about me and I, I can't make a, um, a difference. And, and what, I, what I came to realize um, during the years leading up to the election was that um, the Harper government wanted me to feel that way. It, it wanted me to feel disconnected and powerless because um, by, by not becoming involved, that was giving more power to the, the conservative voters who actually did care and came out and voted. And, and I think a lot of people my age had that realization around the same time. And, and when the actual election happened, um, turnout among 20-year-olds was up nearly 20%. And, and this, it's, it's, it's incredible to, to, to think about that because in, in the years leading up to that election, youth turnout was so low that the government actually commissioned studies saying, will young people ever vote again? Um, democracy might actually be dying away. And so election night happened. Um, voting in, in my age demographic was way up. And, and like I said earlier, this was a decisive factor in, in removing Stephen Harper from office. And, and people outside Canada took notice of this. Um, at Harvard University, they studied the Canadian election as, as a case study in how to get more young people involved in voting in politics. And Harvard actually put out um, a, a short article saying what happened in Canada is, is globally significant. And I, I, I believe that it was. And um, in that election made me feel that, that I can make a difference and that I should do everything in my power to convince other people that they can make a difference too. So I guess kind of going off what you just said, um, what do you think the best um, thing someone, an individual can do to motivate others is? And as a journalist, you know, how do you fight apathy? How, what's, what's the best way to do that as an individual? Um, I, I think you can, you can point people to examples of where um, collective and individual action really worked. The Canadian election is one good example. The, the rise of Bernie Sanders um, in the U.S. is another good example. The U.K. had um, an election um, this summer where the, the far-left candidate, Jeremy Corbyn, made huge gains. And, and I'm not saying that you have to go out and, and turn everyone into a socialist <laughs> or anything. Um, I, I think there's, there's actions that we can take, you know, no matter where we fit on, on the political spectrum. But I, I, I think the, the best way to, to get people motivated is to show how the larger decisions that are being made in society really affect us on a personal level. And then to find examples where um, when we act individually all at the same time, it can, it can have a huge impact. Um, one of the examples I mentioned earlier was this fossil fuel divestment movement. And so uh, um, in 2016, I went to Harvard University and I interviewed one of the founders of this movement. Um, it was a college student named Chloe Maxman. She was about 23. And, and when, when, she, when she started this campaign, whose goal was to convince Harvard to sell off its investments in oil, coal and gas companies, um, people told her, you know, you're, you're just one student this is not going to make a difference. Um, it's going to, to hurt the, the ability of the school to make money. Um, 
and and she she didn't listen and and she convinced other people at her school to join her and soon this had spread to a bunch of other universities and then hundreds of universities around the world and then um, investors started to get interested and and schools started to sell off their investments and and what started as as a small action taken by just a few people within a few years had grown into a movement which had influence literally five trillion dollars worth of financial assets and and so that that just tells you um, the power that we have as individuals to make change when we know what our actions are capable of and I think it it comes down to to having that knowledge and knowing what examples are out there and the more we can remind ourselves of that the more empowered we will all feel Hi, thanks for speaking today. What kind of legislative change do you feel needs to happen right now for us to see any significant change on a federal or provincial level? Um, well, we, we're starting to get um, a price on carbon emissions at the federal level, and, and that's, that's really important. That's, it's, it's pretty much acknowledged among everyone who studies climate change that this is what we need, but that's, that's just the first step. That's not enough on its own. Um, and I, I think what, um, what would be really effective to see in, in Canada is, is for governments to remove the, the, the subsidies that, that make oil and gas extraction um, more profitable than it is, and and you know it's 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 funny. Conservatives often get furious any time you talk about government intervention in the economy, and yet we're constantly spending billions and billions of dollars to keep this unsustainable resource um, in in the market, even as fossil fuel executives at places like Shell acknowledge that our demand for oil is going to be decreasing in as little as five or ten years. Um, so I think we need the government to, to acknowledge that um, what we have in Alberta and in the gas fields in BC and anywhere else across the country isn't the future and we need to be realistic to people about the fact that these industries and the jobs they supported are going away and we need, we need a commitment to building the new industries of the future and training people to work in them and a commitment to convincing people that this ultimately is the way to prosperity and, and that's something we, we don't see at the moment but all it would take is a few strong leaders um, municipally or provincially or even at the federal level to start making that shift. So we, we have time for one more question and I think, yeah, right over there. Hi, thanks. Um, I would like to ask on behalf of some of the younger members of the audience here for you to define climate change for them. I think that there's, uh, I, don't, I don't think everybody here is totally uh, has that understanding of what it is exactly and maybe give some examples of concerning things that are going to happen or are happening now during their lifetime that they're going to see and that's going to impact them as uh, as members of our world community um, yeah so at at a very basic level um, we we burn things like oil and coal and, and, and do other things that, that cause, um, <laughs> sorry, it's been a while since I've gone back to this basic level, but we, we do things as a society that, that cause greenhouse gases to go into the atmosphere, and, and this warms our entire planet. And, and as, as a human species, you know, we've adapted to live in, in sort of a very narrowly defined climate. It can only be so hot for us, it can only be so cold for us. And, and we've done very well under those conditions. But, but when we send all these gases up into the air, um, it, it changes those conditions. And, and it makes it harder for us to survive 
on this planet. So the most obvious thing that will happen is that the polar ice caps will get warmer and melt, and this will cause floods all around the world. But um, when you throw off the, the balance of the planet, all these other things um, happen as well, and we're seeing a lot of that now. Growing seasons are getting shorter. There's um, an explosion of, of ticks on the northeast coast that have these ugly diseases. There's, there's pine beetle across BC. There's longer wildfires. We all saw the, the smoke this summer that seemed to stick around forever. And, and then when you go to places like, like the Philippines, um, or, or in Africa, or in a lot of countries across Asia, you're seeing it. It's harder to grow food. It's harder to give water to people. And so basically what climate change is, um, is stress on all the balance and all the things that we need to survive on this planet. So hopefully that is a good definition. <laughs> Um, that concludes our event. Thank you so much uh, to Sky and Jeff. Thank you to all of you. My name is Julian Paquette. Um, I am the manager of the Salt Spring Forum, and it's been a pleasure uh, to work with the Student Council. Thank you to all of you. Um, if you could just wait for one minute here, um, I just have some important thank yous uh, to do. So thank you to all the students, all of you who came out today, um, and to our amazing volunteers, uh, our awesome sponsor, uh, The Country Grocer. They've uh, really um, helped this event happen, as well as our donors and members. This event couldn't have happened without you, so thank you. Um, the Salt Spring Exchange, Salt Spring Air, The Driftwood, uh, Salt Spring Books, who are selling copies of Jeff's book, can you autograph or sign some after? Yeah, <laughs> okay. So pick up a copy. Um, thank you to Auntie Pesto's uh, Robert Reinhardt of Video RX. We live streamed this event on Facebook today. So share it, uh, rewatch it. Um, it's on our Facebook page. Uh, Dave Volrath for the sound and all of you for attending. Thank you. And I hope this is one of many youth-focused events we'll do at the school. Thank you.